good evening, everybody, and welcome to our Thursday night Anamkara meditation program. With all my heart and with all my love, I welcome you to our program tonight. Special occasion, we get to get together this evening on a wonderful holiday of the great goddess, Bridget. And so this is in bulk, and it's a holiday that celebrates this um, time of the sort of the, the pre-beginning of spring. And bulk falls right between the uh, winter solstice and the spring equinox. So I'll be talking a bit more about that in a little while. But I wanted to get started with just giving ourselves a chance to help settle the mind, settle our awareness uh, so that it's prepared to really enter the depths, having left behind the day, the week, whatever the events might be. And so we make use of a simple practice that we've been doing along with the harmonium of slowing and deepening the breath. And this is critical. I mean, the yogis discovered this thousands of years ago, but we have a raft of research on it now that shows by making the, the breath more diaphragmatic, sort of belly breathing, because typically people are breathing up in their chest. So allowing it to slow and deepen and become diaphragmatic. And that slowing of the breath is actually triggers a cascade of responses in the body because the body uh, recognizes it as what's called resonant breathing. Resonance means there's already a built-in pattern, a frequency that the body, the nervous system recognizes. And when we slow the breath down to roughly 10 to 12 seconds per breath, so that's roughly five or six seconds in, five or six seconds out, that's the mechanics of it, but we're letting go and allowing it to deepen. That is a pattern that then uh, does a positive stimulus to the vagus nerve that's intimately connected to everything from our gut, to our heart, to our head, and also related to the deep, profound relaxation response. The other side of it, it's connected to the stress response, but breathing like this is invoking that relaxation response. So we slow and deepen the breath, that's helping the body. We're inviting all the muscles to soften and warm and let go. And then we invite the mind to take its seat on the breath, to just rest on that flow of the breath, coming in and going out. And in order to help the mind do that, we give it a simple sound that it repeats silently in the mind. And it's an ancient mantra, two syllables, ah and hum, very simple. Ah, silently as the breath comes in. Hum, silently as the breath goes out. That's a mantra that means I am. Just the bare awareness of I am. The awareness of being before becoming. Most of the time our mind says I am and then fills in the blank afterwards with all kinds of things that may distress the body, may agitate the mind. So we let them all go. So we can just rest in that pure awareness. Because awareness, unagitated by having become something, oh, that awareness, that is spacious, that is boundless, that is free. That spacious awareness is colored, in a sense, by the, the boundless nature of love, compassion, uh, steadiness of equanimity, um, rapturous joy, so if we really settle into that spaciousness of awareness, that spaciousness of pure being, we will come to experience directly what Buddha called the four immeasurables, those qualities of boundless loving compassion, uh, the, the kindness, the wisdom, the rapture, um, the sh unshakable equanimity. All that just by letting go and letting go and letting go. So it's also a relief for the poor doing mind that's always trying to do something to make it happen. This, it's invited, do nothing. Let go, let go, let go. And just rest on the breath. So the breath comes in silently with an ah. And then goes out silently with a hum. is coming in silently and hum 
silently in the mind as the breath goes out. Silently the ah as the breath comes in and silently the hum as the breath goes out. And letting go, letting go. Continuing to breathe. Allow that slow, steady, more diaphragmatic breath. Just let it continue. So that becomes a place we come back to more and more automatically throughout the day. You know, if we're exercising, moving around, our breath is going to be faster. But that slower, deeper, rhythmic breath is a way of helping the nervous system be calm, steady, centered, less reactive. You know, and so it supports the mind being less reactive. So we keep coming back to that. And that simple ancient mantra, Aham, I am, just the expression of being. Being, the ground of all being, the ground of all existence. Well, that's the Aham that gives birth to all that is. So if we settle further and further and further into the stillness, the silence, shedding along the way all the different coverings that the mind has wrapped itself in, the roles it's played during the day, the relationships it's in, the thoughts that it has 
uh, clung to. We're just shedding those and shedding them, right? To come to this wide open expanse of pure awareness, of simply being. And when we rest there, we discover that awareness is self-luminous. It doesn't need the ordinary mind thinking and describing, oh, this is going on, oh, that, blah, blah, blah. That discursive mind, so aha, gone. The self-luminous awareness reveals everything as it is, including the root consciousness that is your being, that is the root of all existence. That's what our practices that's what these ancient traditions, these mystic traditions of yoga and Buddhist traditions and mystic traditions across the board bring us back, back home to the truth of who we are and what this extraordinary creation is within which we find ourselves in intimate communion. That's what opens up. And it's also connected to oh, that space of being that's, that gives birth to all, well, that function of giving birth to all that is, that's, that's something that our, our ancient psychology, our sort of collective unconscious and all the archetypal forms, they relate to it as the divine feminine, the great goddess. And the great goddess is known across all traditions, one form or another. Hmm? And so today is uh, the celebration of in bulk. And in bulk, as I said earlier, is a celebration of the great goddess, uh, Bridget. And uh, she was diminished someone. She was tried to, the, the Christian tradition tried to make her just a saint. But she's older than Christianity. Her, her presence is the presence of the great goddess. Uh, Brig means the exalted one. Oh, this is the great mother. This is the divine mother. That, that again, known across traditions, uh, indigenous people of the Americas call them grandmother spirit. Right? And, and we can worship her as the Holy Mother. We can worship her and honor her as all the different feminine forms of the divine, whether it's the Ma Kali or Tara. Mm? These are all faces of, facets of this one extraordinary presence, the divine presence the feminine face of the infinite, right? And so that's what's celebrated in, in this holiday. And it's a holiday, as I said earlier, it falls right between the winter solstice and the uh, spring equinox. And so it was heralding this beginning of spring, right? And that already turn of uh, the return of life. We already celebrated with the solstice the coming out of the depths of darkness and now the light is beginning to warm the earth and in Ireland we can see you know in British Isles as well this is already planting season and uh, there's a wonderful book you might enjoy and it's called in Bridget's footsteps mm? it's by uh, Linda McFadden and uh, she's also a Jungian, so she goes into m many of the archetypal understandings and symbolic understanding and meanings of, uh, of Bridget so that we can relate to it on a variety of different levels. And uh, here she quotes uh, one of the great uh, Celtic uh, scholars, and her name is Patricia Monaghan. And she writes, Ireland is the goddess. She is every field still fertile a thousand years after its first cultivation. She is every river that still floods with salmon despite millennia of fishing. She is the dancing pattern of the seasons, the fecundity of sheep and cattle, the messages written in the migratory flight of birds. She is the sun's heat stored deep in the dark bogs. She is the refreshment of pure water and of golden ale. She is the living nature, and she has never been forgotten in Ireland. And so that connection, that divine feminine connection, connection to the earth, that's so rich in the Celtic tradition. You see it in, in Scotland. You see it, uh, I visited uh, the sacred Isle of Iona, uh, off the west coast of Scotland. 
and the, the living presence of that divine feminine connectivity to the infinite as well as the finite hmm? that embraces that this earthly realm is also the gift of the mother, the unfolding of the mother, filled with the blessings of the divine mother. So that's what we come to know through being in contact with her. And so many traditions invite us into knowing the divine feminine. Some are saying, and I've written that, you know, this is an age for the return of the goddess, the return of the, the divine feminine and what that holds for us. Because, you know, in many ways, what we've seen, and uh, if you're interested in this, Rianne Eisler's wonderful book, The Chalice and the Blade, goes into it. But, oh, 10, 15,000 years ago, when there was a major shift in human culture as very patriarchal, male-dominated, tribal um, uh, peoples were coming into established places of civiliz civilization where the goddess worship was dominant, they overthrew that. And with it came their male gods in a whole different way of relating to the earth. And with that came uh, a much more of a pattern of domination, control, exploitation. And that was a short hop from not only just dominating and wanting to exploit nature, seeing it as, as other, seeing it as something we're not a part of, but it's there for us to make use of. And we can see where that's taken us because that's what we see in our environment now. And the threat of the, the global changes in climate and pollution, it's because we've denigrated that connection. They've denigrated the very land on which we live mm? because that mindset had it as something separate, something we could inexhaustibly exploit, dominate, and control. Well, it was a short hop from dominating and exploiting the land to seeing, oh, that, those people, they're not us. We can dominate, exploit, control them. So that whole paradigm of domination, exploitation, control uh, came out of that swing of the pendulum from the great goddess-centered traditions into these masculine ones. Now we need that pendulum to swing back. We need to find a place where there's not that extreme. And that's why, in part, this is being written about as a time for the return of the goddess. It doesn't mean that we all have to become goddess worshipers. It's much more profound than that. It's not just about what image we hold. It's about relatedness. It's about the feeling function. It's about our connectivity to one another, to our environment. Hmm? So that that feeling function that has archetypally for humanity resided in the feminine, when it got denigrated and set aside, it skewed our whole way of relating to each other, relating to our environment, uh, relating to other creatures on this planet. So we need to come back to being connected because that's the first step to even realizing, oh, we're more than connected. We're one. We're one. There is no other. We are one with nature. There is not nature and us. We are part of nature. And we have to experience the fullness of that and the responsibility that goes with that for being conscious expressions that we could become stewards of nature. We could work in harmony and see that the abundance that comes from Mother Earth is spread equally to all beings, that we can all flourish together. These are the kinds of shifts that we're talking about when we talk about um, shifts in what will happen um, Jung talked about it as happening over the next several hundred years, that this shift, this time for the return of the goddess, this time and shift from the Piscean Age to the Aquarian Age, uh, is all related to that connectivity and that return of the goddess. And understanding it has to do with this feeling spacious connectivity. There are other aspects that have been a part of the divine feminine that also come back. So when we look at 
um, the divine feminine as the archetype for holding space. Hmm? The feminine holding space. Oh, that's the womb. That's why the great goddess in her womb holds all of creation, gives birth to all of creation. A woman holds life in this mysterious way, especially you know, when we didn't know science and what was going on with birth and everything. Here were women carriers of life in some mysterious hidden way, and they bore the fruit of new life. Yeah, so ancient people saw that even a seed, you know, if you plant it in the ground, if it doesn't give up its form as a seed, it doesn't produce life. It doesn't flourish. So even a seed going into the ground, that became known, sort of Mother Earth, the womb. So you plant a seed, and it's mysteriously held, and then out comes this plant that will then feed you. That understanding that holding that space, just the openness of that space, that allows life to flourish, the openness of space that allows intuition to come, the openness of the space of awareness that allows the divine to reveal itself, that openness of space, ah, that's meditation. That's why meditation was also related to that divine feminine. It wasn't a doing. It's a non-doing. It wasn't you know, having to fill the space with thoughts and, and contemplations and exercises. No, openness, stillness, spaciousness. Then what happens? Ah, then the divine, she fills it with what she's going to reveal, not what your puny ordinary mind may be cogitating about. No, we're opening that space to see what the very power of revelation will reveal. That power, well, in the Eastern traditions, that's the great goddess. She's known as Kundalini. She's known as Shakti. She's known as the power of revelation. She's known as Dakini. She's known as goddesses. This is her presence that makes itself known when we create the spaciousness for revelation to happen so different from the masculine, patriarchally dominated forms that are also, you know, always trying to dominate, control, penetrate, exploit. Very different, very different. Mm? Those, those modes of being have a place. They just shouldn't dominate everything because in dominating everything, they've become so skewed, things are out of balance. Our earth is out of balance. Our psyches are out of balance. So this invitation from the meditative traditions, the mystic traditions, to enter that spaciousness of being, uh, that's also connected to how do we hold that space and just that space itself is inviting to the divine. That it opens revelation in that space. Not the revelation of mind thinking, the revelation that comes from beyond the mind, that our nature is pure consciousness. That consciousness uh, illumines what is beyond any conceptualization, beyond the wildest imaginings of the mind. That spaciousness actually humbles the mind when you drop into it, because what it begins to reveal is so far beyond the mind, far beyond even verbal expression. It's, it's one of the paradigm shifts that to uh, understand that the highest ways of knowing will never be encoded in language. They're known directly. They're known by consciousness itself. It's self-luminous quality. So in the yoga tradition, that self-luminous quality the shakti, the power of consciousness to reveal, the power of consciousness to become, the power of consciousness to dissolve becoming. All of that is seen as the purview of the divine feminine. Everything from creating, sustaining, dissolving, concealing, revealing, ah, all carried out by the divine mother, 
the great goddess. So that's when we talk about Bridget. That's the root. The root is the infinitude of the great goddess and her different forms that have popped up in human culture and the human psyche because we're connected to the transcendent. And the transcendent is always going to find a way to express itself. So even in traditions that denigrated the, the divine feminine, oh, she comes back. She comes back as Mary more empowered, uh, Mary Magdalene. And she comes back as Shekinah. She comes back as the goddess returning and bringing with her gifts. Hmm? Because the poor patriarchal traditions and that whole sort of skewed psyche looked at the feminine as a threat. It's part of why they denigrated her so. In some traditions, she became known as the abomination. Uh, priestesses were disrobed and called witches and thrown out of society. Um, this, was, this was a reflection of how fragile the poor masculine patriarchal cultures were at that time, so threatened by the, the power of the, the divine feminine. But now it's time to return and return, invite her back with open arms, not as a threat, but as our partner, hmm? as, as that aspect of our consciousness that we need desperately to heal the wounds of the earth. Hmm? Because that's another quality of the divine feminine is this uh, healing, right? Bring things to uh, full flower, uh, engendering life. These are all connected with the divine feminine. Even the ancient symbol of the divine feminine, the snake that you'll see in a Euroboros, the snake you know, chasing its tail. Well, the snake was a symbol of the divine feminine because it was related to birth, death, rebirth, in the shedding of the skin. The snake gives birth to itself again, is made fresh and anew, right? So that's another quality that we're trying to get a hold of because we are seeing so much death and destruction, both between cultures in our you know, human domain, but also because the pollution that we've put out by domination, control, exploitation, just thinking we can do whatever, well, thousands and thousands of species are going extinct because of that imbalance. We need the feminine. We need that connected side. We need, we need that in everyone's psyche. So it doesn't just become something that, oh, um, we honor that it's more present in women. No, everyone needs the fullness of both halves of their psyche. Shiva and Shakti, hmm? Radha and Krishna, uh, Jesus and Mary. I mean, when the symbols are in their fullness, it's the, it's the connection between the masculine and the feminine and their fullness of presence, that they both uh, contribute to the wholeness and the integration of our world. So when we're doing our practices, without even thinking about it, by quieting the mind, by opening that spaciousness, we're connecting to a deep part of our psyche that's saying, oh, I want to open to that unity awareness, that connectivity, that spaciousness of, of embrace. Mm? Space embraces everything. You know, every filament of energy that makes up every tiny atom, it's held in space. The same space that holds the solar system, planets, galaxies, space, the divine womb, in which everything arises and subsides, arises and subsides. So we can see that meditation as a practice is helping us to step back and just see, you know, the creative nature of Shakti dancing as thoughts arising and subsiding, coming up, disappearing. They have no essential nature other than energy dancing as form, form that's effervescent, impermanent. Hmm? And we're just watching, ah, just watching the play of creativity. 
So simultaneously, we're seeing the dance of the divine feminine, the giver of form. And we're sort of aligning ourselves with sort of what, what in the yoga tradition, with Shiva consciousness, the, the pure witness who just watches in sheer delight as his loved one puts on the play of creation, his own playing and creating all the forms, including all forms of his form. So in meditation, that's part of what we're doing. We're getting out of the role of this little mind doing this little thing, uh, fighting with its past, fighting with its future, worried about this, concerned with that, all that content. Mm. Step back, step back. Mm. You don't have to hammer at it. Don't get involved with it. Just watch. Mm. These are the sparks coming off a fire. They'll go up, fall, disappear. They're just watching. We're now attuning ourselves to that infinite spaciousness of being. Oh, we could call it the void. We could call it this. We could call it that. We don't have to call it anything. Because anything we call it, that's just another creation of the limited mind. Hmm? She just is. This play is just unfolding. So the practices invite us to enter that consciousness and reclaim that space that capacity to hold, to just hold and be present, to let things gestate, to come, to grow, to come to fruition, to pass, to grow again, to grow again. We're just watching. We're just watching with delight. We're watching with love. We're watching the play of our own self. That's what we're invited to in these traditions. The mystic path is going beyond all concepts, all dogmas, all religions, to see this play of the infinite and how it manifests delightfully as St. Brigid or as Tara or as Kuan Yin or as Ma Kali or as Parvati. Yeah? All delight, all the dance of forms, all held in the infinite spaciousness of being awareness. Mm. That awareness, that's home, that's both, that's all, that's everything, nothing left out. So when we celebrate these kinds of uh, manifestations, faces of the infinite, they're delightful as they are, uh, and, and say, Brigid or the great goddess Brigid uh, and seeing, seeing her and how she's depicted in Celtic traditions and in Ireland, that's wonderful. But we can also see how she is oh, the flowering of the infinite one. Mm. And by knowing that, we get to know all her different faces. And we love and appreciate all of them. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to be uh, chanting. And we're going to be chanting a mantra that invokes the Divine Feminine. It's the mantra of Green Tara. Green, of course, for the Emerald Isle and St. Bridget. Right? So we'll be chanting the Om Tare Tu Tere Tore Soha. Om Tare Tu Tere Tore Soha. And that's the mantra that invokes this feminine face of the infinite, the one who leaps forward to relieve the suffering of all beings, the one that heals, the one that renews, the one that refreshes, the one that embraces. And Tarama has many different faces, many different colors. So we have red, red Tara and, and black Tara, though she's depicted as blue, that's how that's done. But Tara, in her many facets, are all faces of the one and all inflections of the feminine face of the one. The one. Oh, that's you. That's you. These are your faces. These are your qualities. This is who you are. So if we let go of our identification 
with the limited mind, personality, roles, all those things, and open that spaciousness, we come to know the fullness of the truth of what pure being is. So we'll chant for a few minutes, then we'll just sit in the stillness, the silence that allows all that is to be all that is embraced by love.
ओम धारे तारे तोरे सो 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 resting in that stillness that spaciousness that is the divine embrace of the great goddess your own true self rest rest there
truly benefit everyone and may all beings know complete freedom from suffering. And namaste. Now entering that stillness, that spaciousness, the heart of the infinite, the heart of the divine, the heart of who you are. Come to rest there in the divine embrace. It embraces all of you. Nothing left out. Nothing rejected. Know that love. Rest there. That's the invitation. Keep coming home to that the great mother, known so many names, Bridget, Tara, you. Oh, great mother, you are the seeker and the sought, the teacher and the taught, playing a two, but always you. You. To do the practices that clear the space for knowing what already is. This is already your nature. Just the other side of the mind and its identifications is this infinitude, this ocean of love, patience, kindness, generosity. Know that. And you're then you're empowered to walk that into the world. This is the true empowerment. We're empowered by that love, that grace, to know the truth of who we are and then see the truth of all that is as our own self. There's no other to dominate, to control, to exploit. There's only one. Treat that one with loving kindness. I want to thank you all for coming this evening and being ones who do these practices, who pursue this understanding, this contemplation, this direct experience of the truth of who you are. And that then you walk it into the world, into your everyday lives and relationships, work, everything. It's all, all there, all the time. So thank you. Thank you for carrying that grace of your own self into the world. <laughs>